Good morning, everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, uh, just a few announcements. Um, I wanted to remind everyone that uh, 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 we have a holiday party uh, that a lot of people have spent a lot of time organizing, and it should be wonderful at the Green, uh, Greenberg Center. Um, in a, I think it's next next Thursday. Um, and so please put, make sure you have that on your, on your schedules. Um, and it starts at 4.30 to, uh, to help um, facilitate some of our staff joining us for part of it after they finish work. And so for those of you who can, um, uh, please join us early um, to spend time with our staff celebrating the holidays. Um, second uh, item is uh, we will uh, return back to Fitkin, I believe, uh, next week. Uh, that's correct. Okay. Um, so uh, it should be, its renovation should be complete uh, by this end of this week. So uh, uh, don't make the mistake of trudging out to TAC next week. Come go to Fitkin. And with that, I'd like to introduce uh, um, uh, uh, our speaker, and, uh, and you're going to make some introductions. Thanks. I'm not the speaker, you all know me. <laughs> I live here with you, but I have the honor of introducing um, Dr. Linda Gillum, um, who is an expert in echocardiography, um, women in heart disease, and uh, valvular heart disease. Um, interesting, as I walk over, I, I learned that she actually has a longstanding connection here to New Haven. Um, but before that, she came um, through her training through McGill and um, Queens, um, and then completed her echo, uh, well, cardiology at Toronto and her um, echo training at um, the Mass General. Um, from there, she made her way to Connecticut, um, and at that time, actually, echocardiography was um, in, in the realm of radiology, so of another time, um, and, um, but lived here in New Haven and enjoyed New Haven and had her children here, um, but worked up um, at Hartford Hospital. Um, at present, um, Dr. Uh, Gillum um, is associated with Jefferson University as a full professor there, um, and as Atlantic Health System. Um, but importantly, where she's really been, um, gained her, uh, her fabulous reputation um, is actually as a teacher um, and has been awarded important teaching um, awards through the American Society of Echocardiography and as a mentor. And when I first learned about Dr. Gillum, it was actually because my mentor in Echo was um, a, a physician named Judy Mangione who spoke endlessly um, about her own mentor, Linda Gillum. And so in many ways, just meeting Dr. Gillum is me um, becoming of that third generation down in this line of mentorship, which is so important um, in any of our training, um, but particularly for me as a, a female physician. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Gillum has been um, a president of the American Society of Echocardiography, plays an extremely important leadership role in the American Heart Association, um, and uh, was recently named a master in the College of ACC. So today she's going to speak to us about valvular heart disease, but during our day she'll also take time to have lunch um, with our fellows who are interested in imaging. So for those fellows who are listening, please join us. Um, in Dana midday um, to continue the conversation with Dr. Gillum. But this is a great honor for us um, to have you speak to us about valvular heart disease, a field that's rapidly moving um, with expanding um, options for, our, for management and treatment of our patients. So uh, thank you for those kind words of introduction and thank you to all of you for sort of braving this kind of not so pleasant uh, uh, post-storm morning to, uh, uh, to come here uh, to learn about ischemic mitral regurgitation and sort of my take on what is the state of the art. These are my disclosures. I do have core lab contracts that uh, uh, allow us to provide core lab work for a number of devices that are being investigated for mitral interventions for which I received no direct compensation, and I'm also the national co-PI for the Class 2D trial, which is a trial that's evaluating one of these devices for which I also received no compensation. But probably the most important disclosure is that although this is a top uh, discussion of uh, valvular heart disease, as you, as you could gauge from the introduction, I have a strong echo background, so you will see that there is kind of an echo bent to, uh, uh, to many of my, my comments. So let's start off with just a definition. So if you, were, if you were to say, as the name implies, that ischemic mitral regurgitation is MR that occurs in the context of coronary ischemia or myocardial infarction, <clears throat> at the medical student level, maybe the first year cardiology fellow level, one of the things that sort of pops into people's head is, oh gosh, papillary muscle rupture. This is such an exciting sort of condition. It's, we like it because 
presents dramatically, we have tools to make the diagnosis, and generally it can be fixed successfully uh, surgically, and we all feel good about it. But in the overall context, microregurgitation that's due to myocardial infarction or ischemia, in fact, very rarely occurs on the basis of actual disruption of the mitral valve apparatus. So the vast majority of patients who have ischemic mitral regurgitation in the literal sense have, have it in the context of a structurally normal mitral valve. So one of the important things to understand is that the term ischemic mitral regurgitation really refers to a subset of patients who have functional, although now with the guidelines the preferred term is secondary, uh, mitral regurgitation. And that's defined as MR that occurs in the presence of typically anatomically normal leaflets and cords when there's left ventricular dysfunction and remodeling. If the LV problems are on the basis of a coronary artery disease, that's ischemic mitral regurgitation. If it's on the basis of something else, dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, uh, for other uh, causes, we just use the term secondary MR, or I think a lot of us still use the term functional uh, MR. So that's what I'm talking about here. So why would I argue that this deserves an hour of your time on a snowy uh, December morning? Well, first of all, it's extremely common. And although the actual numbers vary depending on the group that's being evaluated and the tool that's being used to make the, the diagnosis, perhaps some of the cleanest data come from a study now, now several years old from Mayo Clinic in which they looked at patients who had myocardial infarctions 30 days out. And what they found was that overall 50% of them had mitral regurgitation mild in 38%, but moderate to severe in 12%. And they noted in that group of patients that there was an association with triple vessel disease and inferior wall myocardial infarction. I'm going to come back to this concept of uh, the importance of inferior wall myocardial infarction because as things have played out, this subset of patients appear to be different than those who have ischemic mitral regurgitation on the basis of more generalized left ventricular dysfunction and triple vessel and triple vessel disease. So the second reason that I think it's deserving of your attention is that it's prognostically important and prognostically important in the bad way. So if we go back, and this has been an absolutely consistent message going back to the SAVE trial ages and ages ago and the first TIMI trial. Imagine a time when there was a TIMI trial that had no number attached to the end of it. So way back then, the observation was made that even mild mitral regurgitation detected in these studies and geographically and in patients with coronary artery disease was prognostically important, carrying significantly increased risk of mortality and severe heart failure. We also know over the years, uh, of a lot of studies done largely with echo methods that the prognosis worsens as the MR severity increases. So this is an older study in which the uh, MR was quantitated, sort of, I say, semi-quantitatively, -qu uh, to so, sort of no mild or moderate and severe. And you can see that there was progressively poorer uh, overall survival is what's on the uh, x-axis. The uh, 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 depending on how severe it was. And if you looked at survival free of heart failure, again, the same sort of semi-quantitative, qualitative methods, moderate to severe, these patients definitely did well, although there was no significant difference between those who had either no or mild degrees. And then along came PISA, which, uh, which continues to be, despite all its warts and blemishes, one of the cornerstones to echocardiographic quantitation of mitral regurgitation. And, and this study uh, from Marie Serrano's group pointed out that if you used PISA cutoffs, you could, I don't know, is there a pointer here? Perhaps not. Well, this, I think it's fairly, um, maybe I can use this. Yes, you can see that, good. So what you can see is that if you broke down uh, uh, the severity of MR based on PISA calculated regurgitant volume, even when the regurgitant volumes were what we would consider to be in the mild or low end of moderate range, you saw a significant impact on overall survival. The, uh, and if you used DROA, which is the other measure that comes out of PISA calculations, again, what they showed is that even cutoffs that would put these patients 
typically in the mild range, you saw that there was a significant negative impact on survival. Now this study was important for a number of reasons, some good, some bad. The good was that it provided yet another example of the importance of quantitation, basically saying that there's additional information when you quantitate microregurgitation. If you step back and you sort of say, in patients who've had myocardial infarction, so all these patients have ischemic microregurgitation, uh, there has not been a single study that has sort of differed from this message that this is prognostically important. So here's the line of unity here. And if there were any studies that said it was not such a bad thing or, or even was a good thing to have, they would be over here. And there were none. There is no study that crosses the line of identity. A very consistent message, regardless of the technique that you use to make the diagnosis. And just in case you're thinking, well, things have changed, we're sort of better, this is a more recent meta-analysis that looked more generically at patients with secondary mitral regurgitation, although the vast majority had ischemic mitral regurgitation. And they provided a number of graphs, this being just one. But again, here's the line of uh, identity here. The, and what you see is that there is, all the studies are to the right. And in this case, the, these were, were studies that use semi-quantitative ways of setting mitral regurgitation, but they provide data on those that use quantitative approaches. They provide data based on just saying yes or no, there's mitral regurgitation, and the graphs all look the same. So there's absolutely no question that ischemic mitral regurgitation is prognostically important. And more recently, studies have pointed out that not only is it a bad thing just in, at one point in time, if it, get, if it gets worse over time, which does happen, that's an even, uh, that c uh, connotes an even worse uh, prognosis. So I suppose, you know, I, one of the questions that we want to try to answer is, well, why is there regurgitation when the valve apparatus is structurally normal? And this is, uh, there may be some other people in the, in the room who remember the earliest days of 2D echocardiography. So you can see that the image to the left is pretty fuzzy. But what was observed, and this was in patients out of Harvey Feigenbaum's lab, these were in patients who had the clinical syndrome of, of uh, ischemic mitral regurgitation. And what was observed was or what was interpreted was that this showed an actual failure of leaflet co-optation between the anterior leaflet here and the posterior leaflet here. This was the artist's rendering of these observations here. And the term incomplete closure was uh, defined. Uh, and the assumption was that there actually was, in all of these patients, a regurgitant orifice that you could see if you looked with 2D echocardiography. So of course, as 2D echo techniques have improved, we realize that it's in the small minority of patients that you can see on a 2D image that the, uh, the actual uh, anatomic virgin orifice. But it has brought uh, into clearer focus that what, what is happening is we're seeing pathological tethering of the leaflets, seen here in this parasternal long axis view, here both anterior and posterior leaflets, seen here in the four-chamber view, and along with it, the mitral regurgitation that's sometimes eccentric that goes with it. And so we've seen that term incomplete closure replaced with the term apical tethering. And so one of the take-homes from the presentation should be that apical tethering is the marker of functional mitral regurgitation generally, and in particular ischemic mitral regurgitation. So just to sort of show you, this is what it looks like in real time here. You see what you should now appreciate as this sort of hockey sticking kind of look, but this tenting. And if you imagine, that, the, that there's uh, uh, just tension on, on the cords uh, through the leaf, to the leaflets, sort of pulling them down and not allowing them to co-apt in the plane as, as is typically the case. The group at Mass General, my former colleagues, deserve a lot of credit for helping us elucidate, elucidate the mechanisms of ischemic mitral regurgitation. And so at a 30,000 foot level, you will have uh, uh, mitral regurgitation when there is an imbalance between the forces that close the leaflets and the forces that tether the leaflets. Obviously, there has to be some tethering. If not, every time the ventricle squeezes, the leaflets will sort of billow back. This is 
what we encounter in degenerative mitral regurgitation, and the valve will leak. So we want these forces to be critically balanced. So you can have pathologic tethering either on the basis of increased tethering or you can have decreased clothing forces. And decreased clothing force, the term is really a surrogate for left ventricular systolic uh, function. Pathologic tethering can occur either through the papillary muscles or it can occur through the annulus. And what we've sort of learned <coughs> is that in patients who have classic ischemic mitral regurgitation, both these mechanisms come into, into play. And this is going to be just the three, same three-chamber view that was used in the schematic again, hopefully just making this point again and again. This is what tethering looks like, and here's the MR that, that occurs with it. So if you were to play detective and say, well, gosh, you know, in, in real world, the, what are the things that could cause these imbalances? Well, obviously left ventricular systolic dysfunction, uh, displacement of the papillary muscles, papillary muscle function per se, very important, these papillary muscles, and dimensions of the mitral annulus. So what have we learned? Well, let's start first with intrinsic function of the papillary muscles. And this is again something where there has been no deviation from this. These studies go way back to the 60s. And these were studies in which uh, in animal models, the papillary muscles were knocked out either through ligation. In some of the studies, they injected formaldehyde. The papillary muscles did not work. And what they showed consistently was that papillary muscle dysfunction per se does not cause mitral regurgitation. And in fact, in more recent studies, using this same sort of schematic, if you start with an animal model, and typically it's going to be a sheep model, and you create ischemic mitral regurgitation, you create that tethering pattern, you establish that traction with the papillary muscles still contracting, the contraction of the papillary muscles is actually kind of uh, 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 contributing, if you like, to the tethering. And in fact, if you kill the papillary muscles, if you extend in this animal model infarction to involve the, pa the papillary muscles, rendering, rendering them dysfunctional, you in fact will paradoxically reduce the amount of tethering and in animal models you will restore coaptation and you may in fact eliminate the mitral regurgitation that you just established in your model. So again, absolutely clear message that intrinsic dysfunction of the papillary muscle is not a cause of ischemic mitral regurgitation. And I would argue that the term papillary muscle dysfunction, which is still used to describe this condition, should be eliminated from, from your uh, uh, vocabulary. So I've left a little slit here just to say that we've talked about it, but really it doesn't deserve to be on this grid at all at this point. So what are some of the other possibilities? Well, left ventricular systolic function. These would be the closing forces. So this particular study was a study with non-ischemic mitral regurgitation, but it was an animal study in which they created uh, severe left ventricular systolic dysfunction with beta blocker poisoning is basically what they, what they used. And they tr before they did this, they created a pericardial constraint. So the model was set up so the ventricle could uh, not remodel and it couldn't even really dilate uh, appreciably. And they tried to separate the effects of LV function as they measured by EF and DP by DT and leaflet tethering geometry by looking at these animals pre and post the removal of pericardial constraint. So this is not my study. These images were taken from the, uh, from the paper. Hopefully you can appreciate it on the left. This is a systolic frame. Left ventricle is on the smallish side and there's no mitral regurgitation. Here's another systolic frame after the ventricle has been poisoned. You get the sense that it hasn't contracted as well. And there's a little bit of mitral regurgitation there, not much. But it was only when the pericardial constraint was removed and the ventricle was allowed to remodel that significant mitral regurgitation uh, uh, was, uh, was brought out. So they concluded in this study that LV dysfunction alone does not cause significant functional mitral regurgitation. This has actually uh, been borne out in other studies as well. And this was a study from, uh, from our lab in which we used um, elective angioplasty 
as a human model of transient acute coronary occlusion. We had a mixture of patients with CIRC LED and right coronary artery disease. All of these patients had normal left ventricular function and no significant mitral regurgitation at baseline. And what we observed was that even though, as you would expect during the, the vessel occlusion, we saw extensive wall motion abnormalities. There was significant, meaning moderate to severe MR, in only one of the 83 uh, patients, mild MR in 35, and no or trace MR in, in 37. So these pictures are old. They were originally recorded on, on videotape. As I said, this is an old study. But hopefully you can see, again, this three-chamber orientation. This is baseline, good ventricular function, no MR. And this was during LAD inflation here. The, and what you can see, hopefully, is this fairly large wall motion abnormality. Ventricle hasn't gotten bigger, but there's wall motion dis, uh, there are wall motion abnormalities and LV systolic dysfunction, but with that, only a little bit of mitral regurgitation. So again, and there are other studies that really support this message, LV systolic function per se is not the primary driver of this pathologic tethering. It's a very elegant in vitro study that was done that tried to sort of tease out these possible mechanisms in, with a model in which they had kind of taken a mitral valve apparatus and attached it in this um, uh, system where they could move the papillary muscles around, they could make the annulus bigger or smaller, and they could uh, measure, they could uh, change transmitral pressure. This was their surrogate for left ventricular systolic function, and they were able to measure directly regurgitant flow rate. So let me just take you through the findings. The bottom two uh, curves are in the experiments in which the annulus was normal in size. And what you see here is with progressively more abnormal positioning of the papillary muscles, you see more and more mitral regurgitation. But it's only when they're actually pretty much um, in an abnormal position that you see that there's any split in the curves between uh, the, the surrogate for normal versus abnormal systolic function. This would be the driving pressure. So no impact in this model of systolic dysfunction until the papillary muscles, the geometric part, is already pretty much uh, established. If you bump up to these curves, in these curves, the annulus is dilated. So you see that annular dilatation alone, even with normally positioned papillary muscles, could cause mitral regurgitation, did cause mitral regurgitation. But again, the MR gets progressively worse as the papillary muscle geometry becomes more and more abnormal. And again, you only see a significant impact of the surrogate for LV systolic function when uh, papillary muscle uh, geometry is, is significantly uh, disturbed. So we, so we sort of would get that, let's see, yeah, we would sort of get back to this kind of uh, diagram. <coughs> and, and again, fairly consistent story, LV systolic function, yes, it makes a difference, but it's not the primary driver. Whereas there are very important roles to be played by the position of the papillary muscles and what's going on with the annulus. So there have been human studies as well, a number of them that have sort of really established this point. The uh, measure that's frequently used in terms of uh, putting a number to the degree of tethering has been the uh, tenting area, which can be measured. And in one study uh, in which they sort of looked at all the potential variables that could influence the presence of mitral regurgitation, they found that the major determinants in patients with LV dysfunction we're tenting, that's fine, that's the final common pathway. Annular contraction, so we have the annulus kicking in. And diastolic volume index, that's a reflection of how the ventricle is remodeled. And here we get to posterior replacement of the papillary muscles. Important determinants were annular dimension. Again, this is the annulus kicking in. Another uh, measure of papillary muscle displacement with insignificant or weak predictors of regurgitant severity being LVEF and the sphericity of the ventricle. So again, there's really a consistent story, but everything from in vitro models to animal models, in vivo animal models to human models, giving us this overall uh, framework as to why ischemic mitral regurgitation happens. So as we were chatting a little bit before, I sort of uh, mentioned 
No, Paul Dudley, Paul Dudley White. So Paul Dudley White, they, uh, for those who may not be familiar with the, with the name, was sort of a master clinician at, uh, at Mass General. And this was his, this was his textbook in 1951, I would, I would say, written before the majority of people in this room were, were born. And he somehow, this was before there was echo, there, before, uh, before anybody had done any of these um, e experiments, but he seemed to understand what ischemic mitral regurgitation was about. And in the preceding paragraphs to this quote, he sort of elucidates that, you know, it's probably some issue of, of the ventricle and the annulus and the papillary muscles. And then he concludes that it's possible the displacement downward of the papillary muscles as a result of ventricular dil dil dilatation is a more important factor than dilatation of the valve ring. Now that was in 1951. And I would say this many years later, we don't really know that one is more important than the other. And we would sort of conclude that in a, in a given patient, they're probably both equally equally important, but I just find it fascinating that that someone who is really a master clinician could understand what's really fairly complicated pathophysiology so well that many years ago. Now, there's one other important piece to the pathophysiology that's very important clinically, and that's the impact of loading conditions. And so, what we learned in the early uh, days of perioperative transesophageal mm -hmm. echo was that when patients were anesthetized, this MR, which might have been what was taking them to the OR at, that, at those days, sort of went poof, it kind of went away. And as people kind of uh, looked at it, uh, it was, it, it's interesting historically because the first paper sort of argued that these perioperative T findings were in fact the truth. And, and that everything that had been uh, demonstrated for this patient before they got to the operating room was misleading and was bad information. They, uh, in, in fact, as people thought about it a little bit more, they understood that the fairly uh, predictable fall in blood pressure and systemic vascular resistance, plus or minus depending on the anesthetic agents, negative impact on LV systolic function, and so on and so forth, would reliably reduce mitral regurgitation. So this was a, a patient who was a patient like that sent to the OR with a blood pressure that was pretty, pretty normal and really no MR. And it was only when the blood pressure was manipulated pharmaco pharmacologically that the significant MR that had taken the patient to the operating room uh, emerged. So I think people largely recognize now that you should not rely on intraoperative transesophageal echo for the assessment of, of ischemic MR severity. But to that I would add, and I don't know what your policy is here, as many echo labs have moved to have anesthesiologists provide sedation with propofol routinely rather than using conscious sedation, they, you will see as well that the fall in blood pressure with propofol will fairly predictably reduce the amount of mitral regurgitation as well. So it really it makes it somewhat challenging to be able to use transesophageal echocardiography with propofol sedation to answer questions as to mitral regurgitant uh, severity. Now, uh, I've shown you only 2D images, and it's too bad Lisa Su Yang, who is really uh, the mistress of, of uh, <clears throat> master clinician with regards to 3D echocardiography, is, is not here. But I would be remiss if I didn't brought, bring to your attention the important contribution of 3D methods. In terms of just looking at it, you know, you sort of see the tethering here with 2D. I think you see it pretty well. With 3D, we are able to, in these surgical off-ass kind of uh, views, we are able to appreciate the regurgitant orifices in these patients are frequently non-circular. I would say typically non-circular and often very elliptical, which becomes important when we look at some of our methods for quantitating severity. But the real impact of 3D echocardiography was, was really to serve as a research tool. And I would say that's past, present, and, and future. So a lot of those uh, studies that have helped us understand pathophysiology really use 3D echocardiography as an important tool, help us understand that depending on the location of the wall motion abnormality, you will see different uh, patterns of, of tenting. They've also very importantly provided us with tools to predict post-operative outcomes 
in patients who undergo surgical ring repair for this uh, condition. For a long time, these tools were only available as sort of homegrown research tools, but now there are conversely uh, available 3D techniques that, uh, that anybody can, uh, can use. And for those who are in the uh, device for intervention space, 3D echocardiography is absolutely playing in, in, in prime, prime time. So I said at the very beginning with the definition that this was a condition in which the leaflets were normal. And in fact, when you look a little closer, this is really frequently not the case. So this was a, a 3D echo study that provided a mechanism where you could directly measure the surface area of the leaflets. And you could also directly measure, in effect, the orifice that those leaflets had to, had to close. And in a human study, uh, what was observed, this came out of the Mass General Lab, was that in normal patients, there was a, uh, a, a extreme redundancy between the amount of leaflet tissue that was available <coughs> as measured by leaflet area here and, and the area that they had to close. It's almost not quite two to one, but large redundancy. So if they looked at the patients who had significant mitral regurgitation, they, they saw that this redundancy was largely lost. But they noticed that the leaflet area went up, but the closure area went up a lot and the annular area went up a lot as well. Whereas in patients who had similar degrees of LV uh, systolic dysfunction, but no mitral regurgitation, the redundancy was, was maintained. And I think all of us have seen patients with really horrible ventricles, and they just don't have mitral, much mitral regurgitation. And I think what these studies suggested in some follow-up studies was that these might be patients who managed to retain this degree of redundancy and therefore have competent mitral valves. These were the uh, pathologic specimens that came from a, um, an animal study in which they used surgical hooks to kind of tether, to recreate the tethering part of the of the mechanism, and what they were able to demonstrate was that there were visible to the naked eye anatomic changes in these leaflets after they had been uh, held in a, in a tethered closure pattern for a period of time. And when they looked uh, pathologically, they were able to see pathologic changes as well, notable uh, among them being an increased spongiosa layer thickness. So this sort of brought uh, things to sort of the, the physician that what may be happening is that the ischemic event happens, you get ventricular and annular remodeling as a direct consequence, and then in some patients at least, the leaflets will expand, and that you will get mitral regurgitation when the expansion is inadequate or when the remodeling is too extreme. To this also, I would add that as we're starting to study this a little bit more, these changes in the leaflets, while initially protective, I would say, because the leaflets get bigger, that abnormal tissue doesn't behave normally, and those leaflets that are bigger become stiff over time. So it's a little like it's a biphasic response. It may help at the beginning and then maybe not so helpful long term. But it does potentially open up opportunities for how you might intervene early on in these patients, perhaps modify this uh, uh, tissue response in a way that might minimize the, the uh, uh, onset of mitral regurgitation. So there's no particularly convenient spot to talk about quantitation in this talk, so I just sort of put it in the, in the, in the middle. The, uh, and I'm talking specifically about echo quantitation of mitral regurgitation. So for anybody who spends any time in the echo lab, you're familiar with PISA, I've already referred to it. And these are the cutoffs that would define mild, mild to moderate, moderate to severe, and severe mitral regurgitation per current guidelines. So the important numbers are severe, is with a regurgitant volume of at least 60, and a, uh, an EROA of at least 40 millimeters squared. So that's kind of where we, where we started out. And then the 2014 valvular heart disease guidelines came along. And a couple of things were really important about these guidelines. These were the first guidelines that draw our attention to the fact that primary and secondary mitral regurgitation were fundamentally different disease processes. This was a very important contribution. 
But then one of the other things that they did, which was more controversial and proved to be short-lived, was that they redefined severe mitral regurgitation in those who had secondary mitral regurgitation using much lower ERAs. So they took the ERA down to the mild range in, in primary MR of only 20, and they took the regurgitant volume down to 30. So this is 20 versus 40, and 30, and 30 versus 60. They left the regurgitant fraction at, at 50%. This generated a lot of controversy, and I think one of the questions everybody was sort of asking was, does the fact that it's prognostically important mean that the regurgitation is severe? To which the chorus of answers was, no. There's lots of things that, that are associated with things, but, but it doesn't mean that they necessarily define uh, severe. And one of the responses that, that came out of um, this kind of um, feedback was one I was happy to be a co-author on, but also would point out that one of the authors of the VAL guidelines was also a co-author on this paper, was also a co-author on this paper as well. And I'm not going to go through, through the details, but suffice it to say that what this really pointed out is that regurgitant volume and ERA are not one-size-fits-all measures of MR severity, and they can vary significantly based on loading conditions, either preload or afterload, ventricular dimensions, and ventricular systolic function. So uh, what this paper did was made a strong argument that the guidelines should not have been uh, changed. And in fact, when the 2017 focused update came along, and it was one of the reasons for, for this focused update, we saw that it went back to the uh, original cutoffs, cutoffs that had never been changed in the official uh, guidelines of the American Society of, of Echocardiography. So those are kind of the numbers that we now work with, at least in North America. Uh, they become important when I get to the end and start to talk about uh, two very important trials, mitropench and, and coapt. So now we get to treatment. And since we know that it's important, it carries a bad prognosis, it seems intuitive that we should try to fix it. And if we could reduce or eliminate the MR, we should be able to re uh, reverse remodeling, we should be able to improve symptoms, decrease hospitalizations for heart failure, improve survival, and all would be wonderful in the kingdom if we could fix this uh, MR. So what are our treatment options? Well, uh, medical treatment for uh, heart failure. The, uh, and the list of agents that we have for medical treatment continues to grow. If I were to have given this talk uh, even a couple of years ago, I would have said, other than for CRT, which has shown to reduce uh, uh, secondary MR in some patient CRT responders, these other medications that we use have no impact on the severity of mitral regurgitation. Uh, as of today, in 2019, the message, as you'll see, is slightly, is slightly different. So for many years, the, the, really the cornerstone of treatment for ischemic mitral regurgitation was surgical intervention. And in surgical techniques, the, the cornerstone was uh, annular, uh, annuloplasty with, uh, with various kinds of rings, although over the years, the surgeons have modified the procedures to add something to the annuloplasty. Well, did these approaches, did these surgical approaches help? And unfortunately, the resounding answer to that question was no, not, not really. And, and there were a number of studies over the decades, really all with very consistent messaging, even as surgical techniques uh, improved. This is one, just a meta-analysis, which looked at close to 2,500 subjects, 1,500 of which had isolated cabbage and uh, close to 1,000 who had, had cabbage combined with mitral valve regurgitation. And what they showed was that there was no difference in terms of pick an outcome, didn't matter whether it was mortality, heart failure, it did not matter that there was no difference in outcomes whether or not you dealt with the mitral valve at the time of bypass or you left it, or you left it uh, alone. Now what it did show was that you could repair the mitral valve reasonably safely, it didn't add to operative mortality, and you could reduce the amount of mitral regurgitation. But none of these outcomes changed, and not even functional class, which was something you might have hoped would have shown a difference, even functional class did not show any significant improvement in the patients who had had their mitral valves 
tackled. A more recent study out of Duke in patients who had clear evidence of active ischemia but who also had at least 3 plus mitral regurgitation showed that it was very important to eliminate the ischemia, whether it be with bypass or whether it be with PCI. But in this series, the addition of mitral valve annuloplasty to bypass actually seemed to give worse, slightly worse outcomes than if you just did bypass alone. So these, of course, were all retrospective studies, not randomized. And that, but they did set the frame for two very important studies that were run through the CT Surgical Network, which is an uh, NIH-sponsored consortium of surgical centers. It's dealt with a number of things, but the two I'm going to reference here both have to do with ischemic MR. So in the first study, they took patients who had moderate ischemic MR, and they were randomized to get either cabbage alone or cabbage plus ring repair. And the approach to ring uh, repair was, was very standardized, and they had 250 patients. The NIH was not willing to fund large, large numbers of, of patients. And although, in retrospect, maybe this wasn't the best choice, the primary endpoint was left ventricular remodeling as assessed with echocardiography. So you might ask, well, how come they only looked at moderate MR patients if they really, with all this background data showing that even if you had severe MR, it didn't matter if you, if you did anything to the mitral valve? And it, the answer to that is very simple. It, there was just not equipoise. The people were not willing uh, despite the data, to let patients go to the operating room who had severe mitral regurgitation and say to the surgeon, you can leave the MR alone. So that's why this particular study was limited to those who had moderate ischemic MR. So this was the initial publication out of this, uh, out of this consortium, and the conclusions were kind of discouraging. Mitral valve repair was associated with the reduced prevalence of moderate or severe mitral regurgitation. Again, as with the Benedetto sort of uh, meta-analysis, it does reduce mitral regurgitation, at least acutely. But in this uh, 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 series, an increased number of untoward events, longer pump run length of stay neurologic events. In patients with moderate ischemic MR, the addition of mitral valve repair to cabbage did not result in a higher degree of left ventricular reverse remodeling. That was the primary uh, endpoint. But it also didn't show clinically meaningful uh, advantages of adding mitral valve repair to cabbage when you looked at other endpoints, predetermined survival, stroke, quality of life, readmissions, and functional, functional class. So they were, they had made the MR better, and there was sort of optimism that if you looked longer term, something might emerge. But sadly, the two-year outcomes showed basically, basically the same thing. So since we have no study that's demonstrated a survival benefit with surgical repair, it begs the question, is the problem that the intervention, surgical annular repair, just simply not good enough? We know that mitral repairs for these patients with ischemic MR is frequently not durable. And in fact, in one study, and we've seen this again, it's really a common theme, you'll see recurrent severe mitral regurgitation in roughly a fifth of, of, of patients. Very important if you look at this literature to look at recurrence of regurgitation, not reoperation, because the threshold for reoperation is so much higher. Sending a patient back to the operating room for something where, especially when the data says, we didn't think it was going to make that much difference. So always look at the uh, freedom from recurrent mitral regurgitation. This was, takes us back to some of the comments I made about the role of 3D echocardiography. And actually, there are a number of 3D uh, and 2D measurements that can be made can, who, that will help us predict the patients who are most likely to uh, recur. So it comes back. Then, is this important? Is this residual or recurrent MR? Is that the reason that the outcomes are so discouraging? And therefore, are we better off replacing the valve than repairing it? And that gets us to the other ischemic CT surgical network trial, in which they took patients who had severe ischemic MR, and these patients were randomized to either mitral repair, again, everybody used the same prosthesis, or mitral, uh, same ring rather, or mitral valve replacement, and everybody used the same uh, bioprosthesis. Uh, New England Journal publication of their one-year data, wow, 
no significant differences in LB reverse remodeling. This again was the primary endpoint for survival, another primary endpoint at 12 months between patients who had replacement versus repair. Although they did note that replacement provided a more durable correction of mitral regurgitation, but no impact on clinical outcomes. Again, they said at one year, well, we made an impact, so let's look again, and maybe something will emerge that's clinically relevant if we follow patients up. But again, the two-year outcomes showed essentially the same outcomes. Even though there was less mitral regurgitation, less recurrent mit mitral regurgitation, and more successful elimination of mitral regurgitation initially with mitral valve replacement, the, uh, and there were more heart failure-related uh, adverse events and cardiovascular image admission, so there's a little bit of a glimmer that mitral valve replacement might be better. And yet, when they looked at the quality of life scores, all these measures of quality of life, they saw no differences whatsoever. So what's happening with these patients? Well, they are being followed to five years. We haven't seen any more data uh, come out uh, of the trial that deals with outcomes. There have been some uh, cost analysis that have come up showing that there's relatively equivalent cost to um, uh, an approach that includes mitral valve repair versus replacement. But again, because there's less MR, the hope that if you follow them out further, you might see divergence and you might argue that it's more cost effective at least to replace rather than to uh, repair. So we're still struggling to understand why our interventions are uh, not so helpful. So it gets to the question of maybe the problem is that surgery itself, that the thoracotomy and bypass, maybe that's the problem. It just, at the margin, has a negative impact. And that was really the part of the reason that, that a number of these percutaneous approaches to mitral valve repair have, have emerged. Uh, some of which mimic the Alfieri stitch, some of which mimic alternative approaches to mitral annuloplasty, either via the coronary sinus, they've mostly gone away, and some using intracavitary approaches. But of course now, and I think you're doing involved in some of these trials here, there's transcatheter mitral valve replacement. All of these are investigational in, in the United States. But the one for which we now have an FDA-approved in indication initially for degenerative MR is the uh, mitral clip uh, device as shown here, and I think everybody is familiar with, with how this uh, works, in, inserted using a transeptal approach, and it's been shown fairly reliably to be a safe procedure. So in terms of this subset of patients who had secondary MR, if we go way back to the EVERST II trial, so this was the trials that sort of were initially evaluating uh, mitral clip, there were five-year results that were presented at ACC now a number of, of years ago. There were only 19 patients that had functional MR. So the, uh, what they saw, there was enough that was encouraging here that they, they were able to demonstrate that um, uh, these patients, A, a survived and, and did reasonably well in terms of uh, freedom from need for mitral valve a surgery, that there was, uh, it, it was thought that because of the size of this patient population that it was worth doing pivotal trial to see, see if you could make an impact. And so out of this sort of background came two very important pivotal trials with virtually identical um, uh, uh, descriptions of what the approach, virtually identical, at least on paper, patient populations and virtually identical approaches to using mitral clip. One in Europe, mitral French, and a number of French sites, and the co-op trial done here in, in North America. So the first results that came out were for the mitral French uh, trial. Again, this was a landmark paper in the New England Journal. And I would point out, since really I'm trying to focus on ischemic MR, that the majority of these patients, 60%, had ischemic mitral regurgitation. The study design, very straightforward. The, uh, the primary endpoints were to be all-cause mortality or unexplained rehospitalization for heart failure at 12 months. Something really clever uh, happened in designing these two trials because the focus shifted away from studying whether or not you helped mitral regurgitation to focusing on heart failure. And, and uh, that, as it turns out, uh, it, 
can be one of the reasons that uh, we got so much extra information out of these, uh, out of these trials. When the uh, uh, Mitra French um, paper was published, again, in terms of inclusion criteria, we wanted to have at least two plus symptomatic, despite, in air quotes, I would say, optimized medical treatment, at least one hospitalization for heart failure, severe secondary MR. They used the lower threshold. They accepted a severe MR that cut up of 0 0.2 for an EROA. And, and that becomes an important distinction. And they use the lower cutoff for regurgitant volume. They use that cutoff of, of 30. They also accepted patients whose EF were as low as 15%, and they had no cutoffs in terms of how big and baggy the ventricles uh, could be uh, uh, and still include them. All these patients were deemed to be ineligible for surgery based on the heart team. And so here was a sort of major data, the primary composite endpoint, all-cause death and unplanned rehospitalization, and no difference between mitral clip and uh, medical therapy and medical therapy alone. And I've got to say, I was one of the many people who said, well, that's pretty much what we thought this was going to show us, because nothing else we've done has shown that, that doing anything in these patients really has any, uh, any uh, impact. And they concluded, they did demonstrate that it was a safe procedure, but when they tried to answer their question, does correction of secondary MR change the prognosis, they correctly uh, summarized their data as showing no, it, it, it did not. And it didn't make any difference in terms of their other pre-specified endpoints, which include cardiovascular death, major cardiovascular events, the all negative. At the two-year mark, well, looks kind of the same. This is an intention to treat analysis, but again, no significant, uh, no significant differences. Although, when they looked at cumulative incidence of hospitalization, sort of looking at the hospitalization data, slightly different, they started to see that there was a little bit of a difference between those who got the clip on top of medical treatment versus those who got medical treatment alone. Uh, not statistically uh, significant. And then along came COAPT. So actually COAPT came in between. There was a one-year Mitra French trial, and then COAPT, which was a two-year trial, but otherwise the study design was the same, except there were some important differences in terms of how the patients were selected. They also uh, included a majority of patients who had ischemic mitral regurgitation, 60%. Now, I showed you what the inclusion criteria based on echo assessment of severity were for Mitra French. The, uh, the, there's, there tends to be a simplification of what you needed to get into uh, COAPT. And it is true that most of the patients got into the trial based on EROAs that were at least 0.3, not 0.4, but 0.3. And they also threw in uh, pulmonary vein systolic flow reversal. But then they had these two other things, and if you get the sense that they were really trying to include patients to, to sort of allow patients to be enrolled, I think it's fair to say that that was part of what was going on. So they did have almost 15% of patients in total who had lower EROAs, um, and some of them actually quite low, uh, quite low EROAs, but they had a few other things that they thought could let them get bumped up into the uh, three to four plus uh, range. The results for co-op, I think everybody knows. I mean, this sort of made, I think, the New York Times probably top of the fold on the, on the, on the front page. The, uh, the primary effectiveness, effectiveness endpoint they made uh, in spades. The uh, mitrocliff very much better than guided medical, optimized medical therapy alone. And the safety endpoint really uh, recaptured what's been a recurrent theme, which is that these are, are safe procedures. But when this particular slide was shown at, at TCT, there was sort of, uh, really, I was there, sort of a gasp in the audience and, and spontaneous applause, which is really unusual if you go to these late-breaking trial presentations. But this was really sort of a wow. Look at this difference between, in this case, this was cumulative heart, um, heart failure hospitalizations in those who received mitroclip along with uh, medical therapy versus those who got medical therapy alone. And then equally impressive, every single, and there was a hierarchical 
um, approach to looking at secondary endpoints, which meant that only if they hit the first one, which was MR of, of no more than, than uh, 2 plus, could they go down, down to mortality and so on and so forth. And they hit every single one of these secondary uh, endpoints. We have seen some follow-up data, uh, three-year outcomes. Remember, these were two-year uh, outcomes and uh, presented earlier this year. And we see that essentially the curves continue to head in the same direction. Big difference between those treated with mitroquip versus those who got medical therapy alone, even including crossovers. So a, a pretty compelling story. So the million-dollar questions were, why were the results so different? And, it, and there's been a lot of speculation, a lot of papers uh, written, and out of these have come some important observations concerning patient selection, and, uh, procedural outcomes, and then medical management. In general, you know, so the usual demographics, how many men, age, et cetera, et cetera, EF, all pretty similar between. But there were important differences that some of which I've already alluded to in terms of who these patients were anatomically and functionally. They had bigger ventricles in mitre French as measured by both volumes and LV diameter. They had less mitral regurgitation as measured by uh, EROA. They had interestingly lower pro uh, VMPs. And the, the optimized medical therapy was uh, not to be too glib, was a little loosey goosier in mitral fringe than it was in co-apt. And I think some of you had, have enrolled patients in co-apt and realized how much uh, your management, your medical management of the patients was kind of second-guessed uh, when you tried to enroll patients in the trial. So the, the trial organizers in co-apt were very actively engaged in making sure that the medical therapy was optimized. There were some differences in terms of procedural and long-term outcomes as they pertain to uh, MR reduction. So the procedures were less likely to be uh, initially successful in mitra French. Either they couldn't place a clip at all or they had to leave with at least 3 plus MR. That translated to more mitra regurgitation at discharge. In the co-op patients, they were more likely to use two clips, and that may be why they got better initial outcomes. There were more procedural complications in the mitral French patients. If we've looked at one year or two year, depending on the trial, mitral French or co-op, we see that there was uh, poor long-term uh, 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 effect on uh, MR in mitral French, so they were more likely to have uh, at least 3 plus MR and less likely to have less than 2 plus uh, MR. And again, guideline medical, guideline medical therapy. Uh, actually, let me make this point. Guideline medical therapy, I wanted to come back to this. These are the first trials that have actually shown that guideline medical therapy, uh, forget the CRT part, but can actually reduce functional mitral regurgitation. And even in mitral French, they got a 30% reduction in FMR with no device at all, and in co-op with this very rigorous approach to guideline medical, uh, directed medical therapy, almost 50% saw a reduction. So we, here we have for the first time something that tells us that medical therapy really does impact it. The mortality in co uh, in, in the control group tended to be higher than the mitra French groups. It sort of argued it was easier to show a difference. So this is all the sort of kind of agonizing over these things. But if we accept that these patients did typically have bigger ventricles with less MR, it, it spawned this sort of concept of proportionate versus disproportionate functional MR. And the idea is that if you have big baggy ventricles and a lot of MR, that's proportionate MR. But if you have relatively small ventricles and a lot of MR, that's disproportionate MR. Mm -hmm. And these patients are these ones with inferior wall, myocardial infarction, typically, and left bundle. But mostly it's these patients with inferior wall, myocardial infarction. Interestingly enough, that's what you have with that sheep, with that sheep model. And what they were able to argue was that the co-apt patients tend to have patients who had more disproportionately severe MR, they're up here with this sort of blob, whereas the mitral French patients tend to have more proportionate severe MR, and maybe that was the <coughs> reason. 
So this uh, subgroup analysis post hoc, which was presented um, by Milton Packer at TBT earlier this year, he sort of pointed out that they did have a small little group of patients in COAPT who had severe proportionate MR. There were only 22 of them, so this is a problem. And what they went on to do was basically to try to make the argument that if you, if you, if you uh, found within the COAPT cohort the patients who were kind of like the mitra French patients, they actually didn't do so well with, with mitra clip either. Whereas the rest of the patients, other than those 22 that were mitra French-like, those were the ones that translated to that overall marked, uh, marked benefit. So in other words, what they were trying to say, if you tried to sort of find uh, patients uh, recognizing that at the start you have sort of apples and oranges kind of patients between the two trials, if you try to make something, find a group of patients that are more alike, maybe the results aren't so different, aren't so different after all. Now, there's concern in terms of that um, uh, approach, the disproportionate versus disproportionate MR, in part because the absolute numbers, the volumes, uh, don't entirely make sense, so this story is not yet done. In terms of clinical impact, well, we have FDA approval now for MitroClip for uh, functional MR. You will see in 2020 new guidelines, and this, the, these outcomes, along with some TAVR trial outcomes, are what are, are making it uh, important for the guidelines to be updated. And, and this last point is something that I think is mostly going to be a not-so-good thing, and that is because the COAB trial data were so compelling any other devices that are being evaluated are going to be compared to COAPT. The patients are going to get randomized to new device versus COAPT. And the only way we're going to get any more information about medical therapy, potentially, and, and even then, not in all of these uh, trials, are the patients who are COAPT and eligible. And a lot of the trials that are happening aren't including a, a medical therapy alone uh, limb at all, which I think is really unfortunate. So how do you sort of step back and look at it? There are those who really say, wow, this is absolutely life-saving therapy. you got to use it. And others, and I think I probably fit into this category, a little bit more of a naysayer, that say that when this plays out in your average uh, uh, clinical practice, for example, that, that the results are probably more likely to be like mitra French, in part because the degree of uh, meticulous heart failure uh, therapy is not universally available. That's clearly extremely important uh, because of this nuanced grading of, of severity. And, and last but not least, that the technical expertise is probably not universally available as well. But that's certainly going to be important. So by way of sort of closing things out, I think the state of the art with ischemic MR is that we understand at basic physiologic level that the mitral valve is competent when you have a balance between closure and tethering forces. When these forces are disrupted on the basis of regional uh, and global changes in left ventricular geometry and the geometry of the annulus, despite the fact that the papillary muscles are contracting away, that's really important, you will see it, uh, mitral regurgitation. I hope I've convinced you that it's clinically important, that it carries a poor prognosis, although perhaps in selected patients, clip repair may Im improve it, although we still have not ideally characterized the patients who will benefit most. And then finally, approaches to an indication for surgical and interventional treatment are still uh, uh, evolving. And of course, I had to leave with an imaging plug, which is that imaging, especially echo, is really important. So for any of you who are sort of junior fellows, junior faculty, I would point out that this is such an important field that regardless of whether you're a basic scientist, whether you're an imager, whether you're an interventionalist, whether you're a heart failure-oriented uh, person, there is a career out of here. There is a lot of uh, work still to be uh, done and a lot of opportunities for you to make your mark in the field. And with that, I will stop and thank you very much for your attention.